Welcome to the Feed and Versus Nourishing, the value of food with positive health benefits for your neighborhood concurrent session. I'm Adriana Bradley, Senior Consultant at the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, and we are proud sponsors of the Leadership Summit for Healthy Communities Plus Youth Edition. At DHEC, our mission is to improve the quality of life for all South Carolinians by protecting and promoting the health of the public and environment. With the vision of healthy people living in healthy communities, it is important to tackle issues like food insecurity across the Palmetto State. Food insecurity is real in South Carolina communities, not to mention across the United States. Oftentimes, food banks, pantries, and other food distributors focus on distributing any kind of food, mostly unhealthy choices. Why not provide healthy choices to not only feed the body, but to nourish it too? Let's learn how to shift the conversation from feeding our communities to nourishing our communities. Today's speakers are Jacqueline Atkins from the American Heart Association, Courtney Watson with Food Share South Carolina, and Arthur Andrew Fisher. Your panel moderator is Michelle Troop from Food Share South Carolina. I hope you enjoy learning more about the importance of advocating for healthy food choices at food distribution sites. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, we'd like to welcome you to our panel today. Uh, we'd like to start by asking everybody who's here as a participant to just open up their chat box and drop in your name and the organization that you're from today. Even though we're virtual, we'd love as you get to know who we are to also get to know a little bit about who you are. So please feel free to drop that in the chat chat box as soon as you get a chance. My name is Michelle Troop and I'll be moderating today. The panel um, that you're that you're at, as you heard a wonderful introduction for, is about that tension that we have found of, of feeding versus nurturing as we've done our work across South Carolina. And uh, we would like to open that conversation up to a wide range of panelists today. With that, I'm gonna ask each of them to just give a, a, us a brief introduction of who's at the table and what space they fill in this food access, food sustainability world. So we're gonna start first. Courtney, if you could just give us a brief introduction. Hi everyone, like Michelle said, my name is Courtney Watson. I work with Food Chair South Carolina as a community outreach coordinator. I really help our uh, rural hub network as they develop their own approach to our program Food Chair. Thanks, Courtney. Jacqueline? Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Jacqueline Atkins. I'm the Community Impact Director with the Midlands American Heart Association. And one of our priority areas is food and nutrition security um, as a support for heart health um, and just making sure that our communities have access to nutritious foods to support that heart healthy living. Wonderful. And last but not least, uh, Andy Fisher. Hi, I'm Andy Fisher. I live in Portland, Oregon. I co-founded and ran uh, the Maine National Alliance on Local Food Systems and Access to Healthy Food. I uh, did that for 17 years and then went on to write a book called Big Hunger, which was an expose of the relationships between corporate America and anti-hunger groups. Great. So we're going to jump right in. That's what we like to do at Food Share uh, is just get, get down to work, right? So um, as I we was introduced earlier, we found this deep tension between the need to immediately feed a community with that free, sometimes non-nutrition food, nutritious food versus um, really building sustainable nutritious food systems. For example, when FoodShare is exploring new partnerships around the state, we sometimes can be met with hesitancy from food pantries um, or other institutions who are giving out free food that might be nervous about having their clients end up paying for that food. Uh, Andy, the first question is for you. You talk about this tension specifically in your book and more generally how food pantries can hinder that progress of a sustainable food system. However, food pantries are a very visible and important part of our food system here in South Carolina. How do you suggest these two different interests um, work together within organizations? So thanks, thanks for the question, Michelle. So, you know, just first off, I've seen in places like rural Oregon and Eastern Oregon, where there are very few grocery stores that food pantries have played a very important role in helping communities isolated communities get access to healthy food. 
But at the same time, they've also hindered efforts to build new grocery stores in those communities because the market's been cornered in a way. Uh, people are less likely to spend money at a local grocery store, uh, especially when they're getting their food for free. So I think this is a national wide phenomenon. Um, and I think it's also tied to the fact that I think it's also tied to kind of a, a mental model that we have. And we, we often see food as an undifferentiated commodity. In other words, food is food is food. Um, but we need to stop thinking about it that way. We need to start thinking about who produced that food, where it came from, and who's profiting from it, from it, not just production, but also the distribution. Uh, there's a gentleman in England uh, who talked, uh, his name's Kevin Morgan. He talks about that we need to start seeking food with values, not just food that is a good value. So we need to, in other words, we need to think, get beyond the economics of it and think about uh, how can we support the kind of society and economy and farming system we want through through that? That said, there's been a lot of efforts to um, you know throughout the country to have to work with low income uh, communities to have them pay a partial amount for for the food that they that they receive. Uh, lots of programs, whether it's through food pantries or whether it's through uh, community farm stands or the like, or subsidized CSAs or the what's called the GUSNIP program, which is a SNAP subsidy program uh, to help people can to help confer some dignity on to individuals. Uh, when they purchase the food, it, it's, you know, they're, they're purchasing it. It's not charity, it's not given to them, they're earning it. Um, there's a great model in Canada called the Community Food Centers of Canada. Um, you can check it out online. And they have a whole network of, of essentially food pantries across the country in which people are uh, built, are there to help the purpose of it is not just to distribute food, which they do, but also to help train people as advocates, as gardeners, to help them get jobs, to help them build social relationships in their community. That's great. Thank you, Andy. Uh, kind of going along those same lines of thinking about differentiated food and food, like you said, that has value, not just as a good value, kind of jumping to the value of good health. Uh, Jacqueline, can you tell us about the listening session experience with pantry clients and the desire that you heard expressed for more nutritious food that was not currently being provided by the pantry? Sure. So um, thanks for that question, Michelle. I think that um, I'll just back up and provide a little bit of context. When we were trying to identify our priority areas that we would work in in, this, in the community related to um, American Heart Association, we conducted some listening sessions with community members and stakeholders. And part of that stakeholder group was listening and trying to hear from the pantries that we were working with that spanned across two counties in the Midlands. And so we heard from our community members and some key stakeholders was this idea around food and nutrition security being a very important priority for the American Heart Association and kind of finding where we could work in that space and how we could make sustainable change. And so that trickled down to us then hearing from the pantries in two of our Midlands counties. And basically, you know, all of them indicated the same thing, both from the patrons that they serve, but also from the pantry leadership is that sustainable, um, healthy and nutritious foods was something that they were really, really wanting to have access to. Um, and I think the sustainability part is really key, right? And so that was, I think the terminology was consistent. Um, and to me, that is synonymous with sustainable, but um, you know, in some regards, but just hearing from them that what they wanted access to was not a one-time fix or not something that could just be on an emergency basis, but that their patrons really had a desire to have access to it consistently. Um, and so I think that was really important for us to hear. Um, and it was important for us to hear related to how we engage with our partners um, and, you know, sort of was the catalyst for our relationship with food share related to, you know, some of our rural areas and rural communities and making sure that sustainable access was present. So I think it was very key for us. Um, and in our community based work, we like for it to be community centric. And so hearing that from them was sort of just a call to action for us to try to see how we could make that happen. Yeah, thank you for that, Jacqueline. Um, consistent, sustainable, community centered access to health, fresh 
fresh produce. This is all right up food share. And Courtney, um, I think you've been teed up really nicely to answer this next question of, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with trying to set up the food share hubs in rural South Carolina, maybe with a little snippet of what a food share hub does, if there's anybody in this panel that um, isn't familiar with that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, food share hubs across the state look a lot different, right? Every hub has its own kind of system. They have their own flavor, their own vibe. They're all run by different organizations who see food access as a major part of their offering to the community. So it's really um, providing food for their neighbors, their families, their friends is a big part of their mission work. And we come in and provide the resources and tools to be able to package fresh fruit and vegetable boxes every two weeks to distribute again to their, their neighbors, friends and family. And so um, it's such an interesting conversation to get to be a part of because in a lot of our rural settings, we see sort of resistance to a paid for model, um, to the idea that these boxes require, and, and you know, this, this conversation has become even more complicated with the farmers to families boxes um, that were distributed by the USDA for the last year. And so now we have an even bigger hill to climb in some areas where our, our folks are so comfortable with the high quality produce that's being distributed by the USDA, they're not ready to start paying for items that we know need to be available to them every month. Um, and so it's actually really funny. I, I, when I first started with Food Share a few years ago in Greenville, I went to listen to Andy talk about Big Hunger and what it meant to be in relationship with um, the broader food system and how we can kind of participate in that. One of the things I really took away and kind of took to heart is that food pantries and programs like Food Share, and even those USDA um, Farmers to Families boxes are just, they're all parts of the solution to make sure that every person, every South Carolinian is getting a well-balanced, nutritious diet. Um, I think we've heard in some of the other panels today and the other conversations about some of the poor health outcomes we have in some of our communities. And it just expresses to me that we need a lot of approaches to this. And so that's always my sort of pitch to our rural communities. Hey, you know, I know you have a really great pantry that is doing a lot of good work, but don't stop there. Don't, you know, that's not the only answer. There's a lot of people in your community that would be benefited by this wide variety of options. And so that's just a little sliver of what we face when we go into, into new communities. Thanks for sharing that, Courtney. And I think it's always helpful uh, to hear about solutions when sometimes what we think about are a lot of the barriers and obstacles, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit now. Um, there are so many barriers to access for those fresh, nutritious fruits and vegetables, especially for our low-income families. Uh, for example, grocery stores don't always stock enough fruits and vegetables. We have food deserts across our state. SNAP benefits um, can be too low for families maybe to procure those fresh fruits and vegetables. These are all very systemic uh, barriers and issues that need to be met with very systemic answers and responses. Um, Andy, maybe starting with you again, could you give us maybe one concrete policy initiative that you've seen work to improve access or a specific policy, policy initiative you would like to see enacted um, on our state or local level? Yeah, you know, I would, I'm going to kind of skirt your question a little bit um <laughs> if, if you don't mind i mean i think ahead, there's i think yeah and i think there's two pieces to this one is access access is two headed one is the ability to pay for the food and the other is the physical presence of that food right and all the other things that go along with transportation and convenience and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the first thing is, you know, I want to say is if people don't have the money to purchase healthy food, which can often be more expensive, they're not going to be able to do that. So income, SNAP benefits are all really key. Um, and then, you know, in terms of physical access, the one, you know, the one thing that I would mention is the Fresh Fruit Initiative, which is probably 15 years old, at least by now, uh, which took place in Pennsylvania, has been replicated in other parts of the country, which um, provides loans and grants for um, independent grocery stores to locate in underserved communities. I think that's been a real game changer in many, in many communities in terms of bringing in new grocery stores. 
That's great. Thank you, Andy. Jacqueline, um, do you have a specific policy initiative? No, I don't. But what I will say, Michelle, is that um, the American Heart Association has released a very bold statement. It's called our 2024 impact goal um, related to addressing structural racism. And so I know that seems a little bit weird to insert into this conversation, but I feel like it's important because of what Andy just said, right? If we're gonna talk about the access piece, it's multifaceted, but some of that provision of access is also related to some structural barriers that have been in place for a number of years that don't allow some of our communities most in need to have that access. So I think, I don't not that I can pinpoint a specific policy initiative, but I think the importance of considering how structural racism plays a role in that ability to access what we're talking about is, is key. Um, and some of that has to do with community structure, some of that has to do with historical redlining and just how communities have access to capital and other things. And so I think that, although that seems like a very weird thing to put in this conversation, I feel like it's an important piece, so. I agree, Jacqueline, and I appreciate you contributing that today. Courtney, do you have a specific policy initiative you'd like to see or you have seen work successfully? Yes, yeah, so I think our favorite policy initiative here at Food Share is the Healthy Bucks policy that we use. It's our SNAP incentive policy at state level that allows folks to buy fresh fruits and vegetables and then receive an additional match from the state budget. So this is food that is you know, paid for by the state to make sure that everyone is getting access to these healthy fruits and vegetables. Um, and what we see is when we go into some of our rural communities that maybe don't have a farmer's market presence, or maybe they don't have any interest in having that farmer's market presence, this is the first time they're hearing about Healthy Bucks, that there is a program at the state level that allows an individual to buy fruits and vegetables at a discounted price. And so that program is something that is essential to us at Food Share and really essential to a number of other programs outside of our work um, and something that continues to come up at the state legislature that we, we really want to see continue and move forward. Thank you, Courtney. Um, as we continue the conversation of some of these systemic issues, we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has been so detrimental to low-income families and their access to those nutri nutritious foods that we're talking about. Um, as we've uh, discussed a little bit, the response from the government has been the commodity boxes that are distributed for free, which certainly benefits families in need. Um, but Jacqueline, maybe starting with you, if you have any thoughts on what the long-term consequences of some of this COVID relief has been, um, if you would be open to sharing uh, that with us first. Sure. So, I mean, I think that, like you said, it's certainly been a great benefit um, for that access to be provided during such a detrimental time. Um, I think we know that food and nutrition security was a problem pre-pandemic and then that sort of that was incredibly exacerbated in the midst of the pandemic. Um, I think long term if I when I think about this because I think about this in relationship to a project we worked with Food Share on just recently in a rural community um, and I don't think there was hesitation. They were very excited about it, but I do think that long-term, the provision of the emergency relief is, I wonder what that will look like in terms of devaluing um, or, or encouraging people to take ownership in, in, in the respect of wanting and being willing to um, pay for healthy and nutritious food um, and seeing that in a larger context as, as a very important piece of their overall health. Um, and so I think in a way, although it was very much needed um, long-term, I just think it may create some additional hesitancy um, for people being willing to accept that ownership and to do that you know, for, for years to come as a regular part of what they do and how they get at, gain access to healthy and nutritious foods. Courtney, from um, Food Share and from a South Carolina perspective, do you have anything you'd like to add to Jacqueline's comments? Yeah, I think, you know, really, if, if we're talking about long term impact is that, that we gained not a lot of numbers from those boxes, right? So if, if everything that we do in our nonprofit industry or in our food pantry in our food system is built on numbers, poundage or numbers of our particip participants or maybe income 
all these sort of terms that we use, we didn't gain a lot from those boxes. Often they were dropped off at a location and available for pickup with not a lot of follow-up or information asked for from the participants receiving them. Sometimes we don't even know if they landed in the homes they were intended for. And sometimes the access for folks who really needed them was sort of cut short. Maybe the hours weren't long enough. Um, they ended prior to the, the end of the workday. So our, our working families weren't able to you know, get a box. And so we just didn't gain a lot from that. And so it sort of tells us, okay, there was an issue with food access, but we don't know anything more about that. I'm thinking in particular of a community that we're working with in the upstate that's been distributing a lot of boxes, but we don't know anything about how we can better, you know, support that community that's been receiving those boxes. Does that community need a grocery store? How can we use those box distributions to tell the story of what kind of grocery store needs to be there? We've lost a lot of data in the meantime that our system is really built on and really needs in order to contribute to long, long term success. Thank you, Courtney. Andy, I think you talk a lot about this um, through the lens of, of what you coined the hunger industrial complex. What would you like to add about this from, from your perspective or from a national scale? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. Thanks, thanks for this question. So the first thing is, you know, is, is recognizing that about one quarter to one, uh, one fifth of the food that flows through food banks come from the federal government, comes from what's called the TFAP program, which is, you know, USDA foods buys one to $2 billion worth of food on an annual basis, even before the Trump administration jacked up those numbers. Uh, so, and they typically buy from large companies who they send out to bid, the companies like Tyson and Del Monte. So I've always, I've been very interested in how do you use that, that massive purchasing, not only for food banks, but for schools to support local and regional farmers. And I think that's the one thing that's really interesting to me of the Farmers to Families Food Box program is that it showed that you can buy from, you know, organizations like the Federation of Southern Cooperatives of, of Black farmers throughout the South and, and lots of other small based, small community based farmers and, and food hubs. Uh, and now USDA is transferring that, pro they ended that program, they're transferring, transferring some of their preferences into the regular TFAP program. So we'll see if that gets a foot in the door to change that funding stream. Um, and the second part I wanted to add is, you know, I think that, that I think it's it's mixed, right? What what's going to be the impact? On one hand, what you saw was when the pandemic hit, you saw a lot of money being pumped into the emergency food system by philanthropists. You saw Jeff Bezos put $100 million, his, his ex-wife put tens of millions of dollars into food banks. And that's because it was the solution at hand. And that's that's the you know, solution that worked for people. It was easily available. That's what was in, again, people's minds about what we could do. So to that extent, I think COVID really reinforced food banks as the almost the primary way we deal with hunger, even though it's completely outflanked and out outgunned by federal food programs. But it was it's what front it's what front and center in people's minds. Um, on the flip side of that, we also saw more clarity. We saw that, you know, we saw that food workers were deemed essential, but not getting essential pay. We saw a lot of hunger. I think that, the, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is that COVID really tore the Band-Aid off and tore the covers off and showed how, how struggling Americans are really, and how, how we were in a very much of a low wage country. And it made it very clear that that kind of system is not what we need. And that's why I think you see the Biden administration is putting more money into child tax credits, they're upping the SNAP program. So they're upping kind of the role of the government, which is really where we need to be going. We also need to be increasing the weight, minimum wages. Administration wasn't able to get that through Congress. But, you know, th those things together are where we really need to go. Um, and that's, I think, I think, you know, COVID made that much more evident. Thank you, Andy. Um, before we go into our next question, I just want to remind everybody in this presentation to please, if you have any questions, throw those in the chat box. Um, we've got one more question to, to get through, and then we're going to be answering some of the thoughts. If you have anything burning in your mind, uh, do not sit there in anguish. Please let us know, and we'd love to answer those for you. So with that, um, we really want to end with something very practical and tangible from these experts we have on the call. So in light of our broader discussion today, how can providers providers, for example, food pantries and other service organizations change those models um, to ensure that the work they are doing fits a larger food system agenda shift. 
Uh, Courtney, would you like to tackle that one first? I mean, like to, I'm not sure, but I will just take, I will say the first thing, I suppose. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, what I, obviously, we just want to see more folks do more collaborative work. And uh, I think that's always the most important thing is that we bring our pantries into the fold of what else is happening in the food system, whether it's getting involved more with the local food system or um, more with programs like ours. We just want to see those pantries that we do really rely on. I think what Andy said is incredibly true. We, uh, we are really asking our food banks and our food pantries to do a lot of work for our communities um, and would love to see them get some support to branch out and to do more things for, their, for the folks that they serve. Great, Courtney, thanks. Jacqueline, do you have any thoughts on this you'd like to share? Sure, so I think Courtney raised a really interesting and great point earlier when she talked about um, sort of following the food, right? Um, that we kind of, there's a disconnect between um, the food and where it's actually going um, and what are the broader needs of where that food, you know, ends up. And so I think, you know, when I think about this from the clinical perspective, we are asking our clinicians to broaden the scope of what they do to include social determinants of health or right, think about the whole person. And so I think the same can be said for when we're thinking about food and food systems, right? Not that just as provision of healthy and nutritious foods, but to follow that food and think about the community in which it lands and the broader need that might be there, right? So provision of food is great, but if we don't educate about how to cook it, how to cut it, how to, you know, how to prepare it, 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 it is wasted. It could be, right? So I think um, a very tangible thing is just to think about this in the broader sense of where the food is actually going, um, the community in which that person goes back to, and what are the broader needs that could help support that community in a more holistic way. And so I think that's a really, really low-hanging fruit um, and kind of something that we should think about um, in, in a much broader perspective. I love that, um, Jacqueline. When I teach our medical learners, I always say when I show up at the family potluck, the dish I walk in with says as much about my place and role in that family as anything that I could ever verbalize. And so we need to think about that when we think about our communities and what role that that food and, and nutritious food uh, plays. That's so I appreciate that. Um, Andy, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I, just two quick anecdotes, if I may, and I, I just want to appreciate Jacqueline for her her mention of structural racism because I think you know it's it the the, the things that can do, get done at, at within the food pantry are certainly there's lots of them, you know Katie Martin wrote a great book about that about reinventing food banks and pantries. Um, just two quick anecdotes. One is I was speaking to a, a a colleague who runs a food who was who's from Cooperative Extension in in Green Bay, Wisconsin. This a few years ago, and she said they were trying to implement a, a healthy pantry program and convinced the food pantry there to stop distributing sugar and all the, I was getting lots of pastries, lots of baked goods, as you all know, there's, there's a lot of those in the, in, the, in the food pantries. So they convinced this food pantry not to be distributing these food, um, these pastries anymore. They found a hog farmer who they sent the produce, who sent the baked goods to, everybody was happy for a month or so. The hog farmer calls up and says, you know, I, I'm sorry, I can't take this stuff anymore. They said, well, why not? Because our hogs are, are getting too aggressive with all the sugar we're giving them. So it just makes me think about, you know, what are we giving to people? Uh, you know, if, if, you know, there's, there's a very clear fit, similarities in physiology between people and hogs. So that's just one little anecdote about the challenges of, of dealing with what we have to work with without going upstream to address the problem. And the other, the other anecdote is there's an organization that's now defunct as kind of a volunteer. So it's called Freedom 90. Again, it was based in Canada and Ontario. And it was a union of sorts, kind of a, and half in, in tongue in cheek of food bank volunteers who were, you know, 70 years old and they're, you know, they're all, they were elder and they wanted to, they were committed to doing what they're doing, but they really wanted to retire. They wanted to be done with this. So they called themselves Freedom 90 with the, joke, with the idea that they could retire by the time they were 90. Um, and they, to do that, they felt like, you know, they, they couldn't keep going through this food pantry over and over. So they started petitioning the government and advocating to the provincial government and the national government to up, 
social assistance, up the welfare programs to increase wages so that people didn't have to come to the food pantry in the first place. And I think that's just an absolutely brilliant strategy that, you know, I'd love to see replicated around the country where we organize the tens of thousands, of, the tens of millions of people who are volunteering at food pantries around the country to, to speak up. Those are wonderful anecdotes. Thank you so much for sharing. We're going to um, go ahead and move into the Q&A section. So if you've got that burning question and you haven't typed it out yet, go ahead and send it in. But the first question we're going to start with is from Kia Muse. And Kia's question is, is there any way to partner with individuals in certain communities to get fresh fruits and veggies to their neighbors? Um, I don't know who wants to take this first. Courtney, I see you unmute. So I think I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah. So at Food Chair, this is kind of how we do stuff. Uh, we work through a hub and spoke model. And so we try to find one real kind of cornerstone organization that does all of the logistics work to packing fresh fruit and vegetable boxes. And then we work through smaller organizations and even individuals to train them as to how they might take an order for their neighbor, especially someone who might be homebound or unable to kind of make it into town during regular business hours. Um, how do you help that person make an order for a fresh fruit and vegetable box? That's certainly something that we do We do at Food Share and we're happy to kind of give any more guidance about your specific community. Jacqueline or Andy, um, if you guys have any thoughts, feel free to chime in. I'll just say there's, you know, there's lots of um, programs around the country that, you know, work with community gardeners or backyard gardeners to provide food to, um, to food pantries as a way to kind of help your neighbors, as well as, you know, there's a growing community fridge um, kind of movement around the country as well, which is just more, you know, a little bit more direct than going through a food bank. Great. Our next question is from Caitlin Guess. Um, Caitlin's question is, I'm curious about the panel's thoughts on the idea of food pharmacies for addressing hunger. Generally, there is a focus on fruits and vegetable prescriptions. Is that helpful or not enough? Um, Caitlin, I'm going to take that question first. Actually, I'm going to go rogue a little bit. Um, we, with uh, the Diabetes Free SC initiative, actually were able to start a fresh fruit and vegetable. We call it Veggie RX program um, through Food Share South Carolina. We're currently in two or three different counties and we're expanding to more. So if you um, have a Food Share hub in your county, and know of a clinic that we should be partnering with, please reach out to us. I know the information will be provided at the end of this panel um, for how you can reach out to Food Share South Carolina. And you heard Andy um, mentioned earlier that the GUSNIP grants, uh, they have some federal funding for produce prescriptions available as well. And there are a couple of different entities, including um, us as Food Share, that have been involved in submitting for some of those grants. So before we get into your question, which I think is more are veggie prescription programs helpful or harmful, in, as far as Food Share South Carolina at least goes, we're currently investigating that question for ourselves. And and there are Veggie RX programs. You're going to see that pop up in more and more counties across the state. But with that, I will um, be quiet. Thank you guys for entertaining my answering of that question. Um, does anybody have any other thoughts? Andy, maybe um, you from more of a, a national perspective. I, I don't have a huge amount of, of info on it. I mean, I think you said you said it all. So I'll leave. thanks, Michelle. I think one thing I'll add, Michelle, is that what we know about these produce prescription programs is that they're really trying to get at some of the health outcomes that we have, not just the food insecurity, but the, the sort of marriage of poor health outcomes and food insecurity and trying to address them in a really practical way. We know from our culinary medicine program that it can be really um, overwhelming for a physician to feel like they can get actively involved in how their patient can deal with some of their barriers um, that might limit their own, you know, good health. And so I think it is really meaningful to get physicians directly involved in writing a prescription for something that's as basic as fruits and vegetables. I think that has a really big impact, especially in a state like South Carolina, where we do have these really intense pockets and 
sort of uh, locus of diabetes, it is a big deal mm -hmm. to give our physicians a meaningful way to be a part of that solution. Um, knowing that those pockets are costing our state a lot of money from healthcare, um, from a healthcare perspective. So I think those are really important programs. I hope we see them more and more. Obviously, uh, Food Share has a vested interest in that, but I know that there are other programs that are running like that across the state that I think we, we will see them be um, meaningful for our communities. Yes. Great. Thank you for that addition, Courtney. Okay. Courtney laugh at me because she knows what a nerd I am in this area, but oh, go ahead, Jacqueline. No, no, you're fine. I just wanted to add that I think this, um, the, the piece of that question that asked, is it helpful or not enough? Um, I think the piece that I spoke about earlier, really like that education piece. So I know that I've had conversation with Kim at um, Food Share about VeggieRx, um, but I think the piece that is important is like, the conversation and the education that's happening over that six month period when they're receiving those prescriptions, right? Um, and the, the education piece being the, the ownership and sort of development of a habit, right? So that at the end of that, it turns into like, this is just a part of what I do um, for my health, right? And if I have benefits that I can use to make that purchase less expensive, then I do that. But if not, I just commit to saying I would spend this $10 elsewhere anyway. So I'm going to just buy my produce box instead. Right. Um, so I think that education piece and the continuation of that, like following the food, right, to make sure that it continues on is important. And the conversation that we're having to empower those individuals to adopt that habit long term is, I think, just as important as the writing of the prescription. So I think that's a great point, Jacqueline. And, and to the point of, is it helpful or not enough? I think that's one of the things Food Share specifically is investigating um, with these VeggieRx programs that we have popping up. So to your point, Jacqueline, and, and thinking and, and talking about, well, these veggie prescription programs where for six months you get food, free food, and then you don't get any more. Is that enough to make a sustainable lifestyle change? Maybe, maybe not. Um, one of the things that we're excited about is exactly what Jacqueline was mentioning is saying, hey, after you get your six months of prescriptions from your provider, you can still continue to make this a consistent sustainable part of um, your budget, your routine, your diet. And I think that that's where we can kind of flip that dial from helpful to actually um, sustainable and, and change making. Great, so our next question is from Misty Lee. Thank you for the question, Misty. And that is, do you have any suggestions on how to recover that data we've lost over the last year regarding food insecurity? Courtney, I think this was to your comment earlier. Um, and Misty says, we're trying to determine a good way to survey people receiving the farmers to family food boxes. Yeah, that is such a good question. I mean, I, I feel like there are probably partners and agencies doing the same kind of scramble work right now. I think um, lean into the organizations that do similar um that, that do similar provision, because I think there's going to be continued interest around regaining that data. And I think the closer you are to your population, the more likely you'll know what the impact of that is. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have a great, great answer, but I, I'm sure that there are people who do have answers and lean into those folks. Don't try to go at it on your own, you know? Great. Any other thoughts or suggestions for how to recover some of that data, Jacqueline or Andy? No? Okay, great. Um, our next question is from Ome Salma Rahamtula. I always butcher your last name, Ome, so I'm so sorry, but thank you for your question. Um, the question is, this may be too wide of a question, but I'm interested in looking at overproduction as a huge part of this conversation. For example, with um, the access pantries example. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Sure. I mean, I think there's, you know, I think from my perspective, there's a concern that supply drives demand in the emergency food system. Um, and just again, one little anecdote is I was talking to a colleague in Rochester, New York, who runs the food bank there. And she said, well, you know, I could go out of business tomorrow, but there's still going to be somebody who pops up 
in my place be, and they're going to do it in not such a great way because there's waste in the system so i think we have to realize that um you know waste is anathema and is more as morally problematic for americans and they want to see that that waste go somewhere so i think the question we all struggle with is how do you separate out the food waste argument from the from the food security argument and not conflate one with the other and go, you know, the, what, what seems like a twofer is just give the food waste to poor people. So I think we, I think as a society, we need to struggle with that issue. And there is massive overproduction in the food system. I mean, there's, you know, even, you know, I, I work in California and there's huge overproduction in, in, in the produce industry. And there's very strict codes on what can get to the market in terms of the size and the blemishes on produce as a way to keep prices up for farmers. Uh, so all that under, all that, you know, food that's too small or the fruit that's too small or blemished or what have you is going to go either into juice or it's going to go into the emergency food system. Um, so that, you know, that's, healthy food when you think about unhealthy food and the overproduction and in, in the twinkie factory because a label got screwed up or something like that you recognize that you know it's just part of the way of doing business um so it is it is it, it definitely drives um i think it drives a lot of the demand frankly i think that's a great point andy i um we worked with a with another organization where we were trying to distribute some whole grains and we were sent from that organization some sheet cakes and there was a really pretty like unicorn rainbow cake and um i was really upset and went home and of course what do you do when you're upset and you're driving home you call your mom and tell her all about it and she looked at me and she said well what did you expect them to do were they just supposed to throw away the the giant sheet cake that they didn't need for uncle paul or whoever's retirement party and so i think that's a really great question and and a a big one that contains a lot of tension of well we don't want to waste but also is the right ethical thing to do to then just feed that to somebody who's low income as a whole grain because they may not have access to something else can i just go back to this for a second so i think you're absolutely Please. right I, I don't i don't think the problem is is you know uncle paul's birthday party i think you know i think part <laughs> i think the part of the problem is just the way supermarkets run. If we're talking about pastries and birthday cakes, you know, if you go into your local, I don't know what your chains are there, but you go into your local Safeway or Kroger's or whatever it is, at, you know, an hour before it closes and you need a birthday cake tomorrow for your kid's birthday, and you look at the sheet cakes, you don't want just the last one, right? You want a choice between vanilla and strawberry and chocolate and pineapple and whatever other flavors you want. So the store feels obligated to have all of those because they feel like that's what the consumer wants. I mean, it's, you know, and the same thing with, you know, again, going back to pastries is those things go bad in a day. So they are getting dumped into into the system. Um, so there is, you know, the just the structure of consumer expectations on some level is what supermarkets will tell you drive some of the waste. Thank you for that. Um, Courtney, what what thoughts do you have? Yeah, I wanted to actually bring in some pop culture references, um, which I know are really helpful. But given that this is the youth summit, I feel like we should bring up TikTok at least once. Um, and one of the things that I've seen on TikTok a good bit are uh, retail work, retail food workers, food service workers showing the amount of waste that they have to create at the end of every shift. And I think this is something that really does bother um, our, our younger generations. We look at this and we think this is, this is not, we don't wanna be a part of this and it makes us feel really terrible. And I, I guess I wonder, how are we gonna how are we gonna participate in improving that those systems? I'm not sure that there's a great answer, but it, I think it is an, all sides attack. And so that's where I bring up my second pop culture reference, win for me, um, is uh, my one of my favorite shows on TV is The Good Place. And I think the reason that it is, is because it brings up the idea that no choice is perfectly good or perfectly bad. And we get into our world, especially in the food system world, where we say, it's got to be local, guys. You know, and I know this is going to stir some controversy for folks, um, but the reality is that there's no one answer. It needs to be an all sides um, attack where we are just going at it from every angle. When we're talking about income, we're talking about um, you know system systemic racism. We're talking about um, our 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 federal programming, and we're talking about all of these systems having an impact on one another. Um, and once we see how intertwined they are, we we can really do better for one another. 
And that feels like, um, that sort of feels like where some of our technology is taking us like, to bring it full circle to say that, you know, our, our young people on TikTok are upset about this. And I think it will create change in some way. Um, and that's meaningful. And I, I think we'll get to a place where we see improvement. Thank you, Courtney. Um, Jacqueline, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, I think Courtney and Andy have nailed it um, at great points, both that they both made. So no, I don't have any additions. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. So our next um, question has to do kind of jumping back to the SNAP incentives that we talked about earlier. Um, in thinking about a, a SNAP um, and the SNAP incentive programs, how do those SNAP incentives, could you talk a little bit more about how those SNAP incentives are utilized and then what role, if any, they play in this larger model of a more sustainable um, food system? Yeah, I guess I'll take a first crack again. Um, one of the things that we know about SNAP, what we sort of commonly refer to as food stamps, um, our, our Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program is that it, it in general works, that individuals who receive SNAP, who receive that food assistance, um, are, they're improved, that they have you know, better access to food, they're able to pay for the food that creates a well-balanced diet, they don't have to choose between food and other expenses in life. And so that feels like a place that we can should continue to invest. Um, by and large, not every administration is the same. Taking take an Andy's note earlier, um, but now we have taken this upon our. It, uh, the government has taken another step to say, okay, how do we make sure that those folks are getting the most nutritious food? And that's where these SNAP incentive programs come in, where we can really connect our food assistance recipients to our our nutritious food systems and make sure that they're talking to one another and not kind of missing out. Um, and so in South Carolina, our program is called Healthy Bucks. And for either a five or $10 purchase, you can get a $10 match from the state for specifically fresh fruit and vegetable programs. Um, and it's an important way for us to be able to kind of bridge the gap between communities who might know one another very well uh, in, you know, personally, but economically might be connected. Um, and so that's a, a little bit about what I'll say about SNAP. Great, thanks, Courtney. Jacqueline or Andy, do you have any thoughts about SNAP and more specifically um, the role SNAP incentive programs play? Jacqueline, no? Okay. I'll say a couple of things. I mean, I think, you know, we have to start off with uh, just the general realization or even perception that uh, fruits and vegetables are expensive. And that if you're on a very tight budget, those are the things you're probably going to forego in favor of things that, you know, fill up your, your family's stomachs for the month. So, um, you know, I think the, the SNAP incentive programs have been really good at, at making produce more affordable, um, you know, and encouraging people to, to buy more because we all know that, you know, no Americans eat the required, you know, they are the RDA, RDAs for fruits and vegetables and, and lower income individuals are even less likely to meet those RDAs. Um, so I think, I think those, the GUSNIP program and the SNAP incentive program at the federal level is, is a really interesting model that could, that could and should be integrated into the entire SNAP program. Right now there's you know, only $50 million at the federal level for this money, there, for this program. There's other money coming from the states and private sector. But you know, if, 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 every, if every individual receives SNAP or eligible, you'd see some, you know, some widespread health improvement and widespread increase in consumption of produce. And so I think it's a great model for, for transforming the SNAP program to something a little bit more healthy. Those are great points. Um, we hope that some of you who are listening today have been fired up and excited by what you've heard. I know I've been excited by what I've heard, although I am a little bit biased because this is our panel. Um, a couple of resources that we really love here at Food Share, um, one of which is, is Andy's book, Big Hunger, um, the unholy alliance between corporate American anti-hunger groups. And then we heard Andy earlier um, uplift a book by Katie Martin on reinventing food food banks and pantries. I was wondering with the roughly five minutes that we have left, 
if each panelist could just give one or two resources um, for any audience members who maybe were really excited by what they heard today and would like to learn more or, or find a tool um, to, to move forward with. Who would like to go first? I spoke first so many times, so I feel like Jack. <laughs> All right, Jacqueline, I'm going to put you in the hot seat first. Are there any tools or resources for people that maybe are just really fired up or excited by today's panel? So I will have to actually get specifics on names, but the one that comes to mind um, initially is some resources around like um, food is medicine. Um, and just like the, the concept of utilizing food to improve overall health. Um, I think that when we have that dialogue, um, it, it reaches a, more people, um, right? And if we have that dialogue, then we are able to kind of connect that back to a person's why and be very intentional about um, the sustainability or their habits long-term. Um, so I will have to get specifics on names, but there are a couple that I'm thinking of that, that, you know, do provide some really good conversation and really good writing related to food being used as medicine. And so I think that's a, a much broader conversation to have and is much more intentional and kind of meets people where they are related to why this is important. I love that, Jacqueline, and I'll uplift um, one of the uh, one of the food is medicine organizations, um, healthmeetsfood.com. It is if you're anybody who is in a clinical profession um, or in a food service profession who's interested in getting some more tangible skills on how to uh, learn not only some of the nutrition science, but also some of the communication techniques and skills to kind of live out some of that health is food mentality then that's a great website um, to get started with. And then Andy, I saw you unmute. So you're in the hot seat next. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a big fan of um, Closing the Hunger Gap, uh, which is a network of organizations around the country who are, you know, kind of on the cutting edge of, of this issue. It's thehungergap.org. Great, thank you. And then Courtney, would you like to round us out? Sure, I guess I'm gonna uplift to some folks we haven't mentioned in this conversation, but for me really circle around our work and that's the SNAP-Ed agents and the FNAP agents that deliver our nutrition programming across the state. Um, those folks are real superheroes because not only do they take the food that we you know, distribute through our food share boxes and help folks better understand them by you know, helping us create recipe cards, but they do the work one-on-one -on -one or in group settings with our neighbors, friends, and family around how to better prepare food for themselves. And so um, if you're not connected with your local SNAP-Ed agent or your FNAP agent from Clemson Extension, um, please make sure to find a way to do that because those folks can really deliver value for um, programming that you might be interested in or ways that you might want to get connected to food systems, specifically in nutrition um, education. Michelle, if I could, I'm going to throw out one more um, that I just about because I spoke about it earlier, but there's an organization called Redefine the Red Line. So if you want to think about and kind of talk about like some of the systemic stuff that has maybe led us to this place or prevents access, um, that organization is phenomenal, but they break down the history around redlining and kind of talk about some of those structural barriers that are historically embedded in communities that prevent them from moving forward with accessing um, things like healthy and nutritious foods. So it's a really, they have a great website, great resources on there, but I'll uplift that just to, to kind of reiterate the point that I made earlier. Thank you, Jacqueline. And that's that's a wonderful point to end on. We hope you guys have found this both informative, but also um, leave this session with some tangible tangible, practical tools and thoughts that you can act on. Um, and with that, we will turn it back over to Phil Ford and the Eat Smart Move More staff.